Hello there. Hello. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 587. 587 of the Agostino Zynga Show. Hope you're well wherever this may find you. I'm doing cracking, I'm doing fine. I've got a green juice in me at the moment. I'm all showered. I'm fasting up until sometime past 5 p.m. Don't ask me why. Then I'm going to eat and break my fast. Then I'm going to work out. Then I'm going to go to work for a little bit. Then I'm going to come back, record some more and do many, many different things. So I'm jam packed and ready to roll. And I hope you're ready to enjoy this podcast that's coming at you live and direct from an undisclosed location somewhere in the big LDN. God damn it. I really love green juices, man. They take an absolute mission. It takes a mission to make them. I don't have a Vitamix, I have like a standard uh, Nutribullet that everyone else has. And obviously Nutribullets, if you know them, they make good smoothies, as in like they make stuff lumpy and whatnot, but they don't actually, you know, blend it or um, juice stuff down into a fine, 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 fine liquid. So what I usually have to do is I have to kind of blend it in the Nutribullet, um, get it into like a mushy sort of smoothie consistency, then run it through a sieve. Then I've got this little thing that I press it with, this little like, you know, stone thing. I press it all through the sieve and then obviously all the juices come out and I uh, drink that. When in fact I think it's actually the wrong way to go about things. <coughs> I'm pretty sure all the nutrients that I found in the fruits or the vegetables that I use are usually in the leaves and stuff. All the fiber, the goods that's actually in the pulp I'm leaving behind. So it might be a good option to kind of alternate. So one day I do it, I do it, um, I kind of try and juice it and another day I try and drink it as a pulp. There's all the mushy bits in it because I'm sure that's where all the good stuff is is in. I'm kind of losing. But if I want to get this kind of consistency of a juice and drink this, this takes a good 20 minutes to kind of get done. But I perfected the little, you know, thing and I like doing it anyway. It's become like a little odd practice that I end up doing. So I'm not really that, you know, that bothered about it. But yeah, that's my life right now. And I'm actually thinking when I actually do end up moving because that's the actual hope at the moment I hopefully get to get to another place a bigger place and I'm gonna have a you know a separate room so I can have a studio and stuff and get stuff sorted out I'm gonna upgrade the camera because I've actually had a few people reach out to me online via Twitter DMs Instagram DMs um, YouTube comments who are basically saying hey guy you need to step this up you need to you know upgrade your equipment to make sure the streams don't go down because you've got too many tabs open and stuff just become serious about it because obviously you've got something good here and obviously i'm liking liking hearing that because when i first started this i obviously started this as a bit of a hobby something just to kind of like waste some time and because i don't usually have a many like real life friends and i spend most of my time online or in nightclubs so i thought it you know in the in between time why not kind of do a little podcast where i can talk about things that i'm interested in that i don't get talked about people that i don't get to talk to talk about in real time because i don't have any real friends and why not do the podcast and obviously with the youtube kind of transpired off that as well but now things are going great people are liking the, my points of view or they're just enjoying the fact that i ramble and ramble and ramble and i get to waste two hours of their day because that's sometimes what i look for sometimes it's not even the quality of the show as long as something's like halfway decent but i can put it on in the background and i can just get on with my day and it can kind of help me kind of get through the day i'm happy because i remember when i used to work like retail especially if I used to work in a stock room. Part of the reason why that job was so amazing and I was able to kind of run, breeze through it and have such a good time was because I was able to listen to like podcasts. And I think back then it was like the Joe Budden podcast, loads of Joe Rogan. Um, I remember the fight companions, the fight companions for the Joe Rogan podcast, I'd actually, I'd save them for the day that I knew I was working in the stock room so I could have like four hours or six plus hours of content to listen to to kind of keep me going throughout the day. I absolutely loved it, man. Actually, you know, the, the, the noise here is a bit nuts, isn't it? I might have to close the window because it's a bit get crazy. Man. Bear me one second. Yeah, that noise was too much. So I had to close the window. Uh, bear with me for that one. But yeah, I've got a mad place where I live where, oddly enough, you open the window slightly and you can hear a fucking motorway outside. You close it and then suddenly it's completely quiet. So it helps. But then, of course, when you close it, the apartment ends up heating up like a fucking kettle. So it is what it is. But anyway, the garden. So many updates coming, many upgrades coming. So keep an eye out for that. There'll be a new studio. There'll be a new camera equipment and all that good stuff. And hopefully you'll see an upgrade in how I kind of take this podcast going forward. And then of course, I'm going to have a dedicated kind of rig or setup to in order to kind of stream and record myself. So it won't be, 
you know, spotty as it is now. Because remember, I'm just using a MacBook. Don't get me wrong; it's a new, it's a kind of, it's not a new one, but it's basically refurbished. I only use this for streaming and recording my podcast, so it's not, you know, jam packed with stuff. But I do need to get a proper PC rig to kind of stream with. I was thinking of getting a streaming laptop, so that might be the kind of thing I do in between, or I might just go straight out and just buy a whole PC rig, get that sorted out, and all that good stuff. So keep an eye out for that. Keep an eye out for that. Anyway, let's jump on into the show. Many things to talk about, many things to crack on with. Let's go. Let's not waste any more time. So, as most of you guys are aware, I think most of you who have been online have probably seen that Stranger Things Volume 4 has finally come to an end. They split it up in two parts, which I wasn't a fan of, to be completely honest, because I wanted to watch it all at once. But considering how heavy and how layered and how loaded and how... Um, diverse and how interesting and such a roller coaster this season was i think split up into two parts was actually the best thing it wasn't as overwhelming and i really 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 enjoyed this show and i think the reason why i'm stressing why i really enjoyed it because i think there's so much crap out there online right now there's so many terrible shows i was actually talking to someone about it the other day about kenobi the star wars um series it was absolute trash it didn't even focus on kenobi too much um the characters were stupid um princess leia character made absolutely no sense because it felt like the character they writ was way older than the character they actually cast like you got this like nine-year-old girl running away from like grown adults in the forest like it's just ridiculous ridiculous series all around like poorly written um poorly put together everything about it was terrible but it's meant to be their kind of flagship series that they're meant to kind of fly home with right and then Stranger Things had a similar kind of trajectory, I feel like. Like, the first season was really good. Then it kind of lost its way from season two to season three. Yeah, season two to season three lost its way. And then I feel like it picked it back up again on season four, which is really, in my opinion, um, not normal. Most of the time, when a series starts to go to shit, it rarely if ever turns it around. It just kind of is what it is. And you have to accept as a... Or you have to come to the decision as a viewer... Am I going to accept the show as it is and just enjoy it for what it is because I'm already invested in it? Or do I bail now and just hold on to the memories? And I think of the same thing like um, Game of Thrones. When Game of Thrones started to go really badly and people on like um, the Game of Thrones subreddits were saying, hey, this show is really shit and people were shouting at them and then they started that other subreddit, I forgot the name of it, that was, a brilliant, that was always full of memes and shit and people were looking at them like they were weirdos, no, the show's so good, the show's good and by the time we got to the end, we all agreed with what they said originally that the show was going to shit and it couldn't turn it around. So the fact that Stranger Things have somehow realised the what they call the Duffo, the Duffy brothers somehow realised and were able to turn this ship around has been magnificent. Some people would say it's because of the the villain in the series, Vecna, um, who's obviously one. I don't think that's actually the case, but some people do say because it's a humanised villain, um, somebody you can kind of um, somebody yeah somebody you can humanise and somebody you can kind of root against. And some and somebody you can band it, you can band behind in terms of the kids, in terms of bringing them down. That's one of the factors of it. But I don't think that's the case because I think if anything, this series or this season has basically showed us that maybe Stranger Things. One of the slight things that they don't do well at is they don't kill enough characters off. There's too many people on the cast, right? But somehow. I also think it's a strength because they're able to tell so many interesting stories of each person without you getting lost, without it always, without, you know, sometimes on a TV series, if there's loads of characters, there's always loads of unnecessary flashbacks. Oh, this is what they did when they were 10. This is what they did when they were 12. Uh, this is why they did this. Or the, just to explain why they're at this current situation or this current point in the story. But with Stranger Things, they do a really good... Um, they're really good at kind of highlighting and making a snapshot of each character, but it adding to the overall story and just keeping it moving. It doesn't kind of linger. It doesn't, you know what I mean? It just, it kind of just keeps it moving. Steady, steady pace. And I think if anything, this series was a good example of it because it was chock full of characters, but they still told interesting stories. You are still invested for them in them. You are still rooting for them and you still wanted to see them win. And if anything, for me personally, it, I didn't find anyone annoying. Like in the first, second or third season, I found Winona Ryder's character, the mum, annoying. That whole bipolar twitchy thing was pissing me off. I found Eleven annoying. I found all the kids annoying, especially the guy, I forgot his name, but all the, the kind of the fat kid. I, f I found all of them annoying, right? Like really annoying. And I couldn't actually watch it for a brief period of time. But somehow they turned it around and season four was absolute barnstorm. And I think 
this season coming up, season five, I guess, or volume five, will might end up being the best, especially when it comes to the all-out war that's going to be waged on the Hawkins, it looks like, because, you know, that's where basically the drama, or that's where basically the beef is kind of being brought to. But overall, what a fantastic series. Like, I got nothing but good things to say about it, especially nowadays since there's so much crap out there on TV or online. It feels like no one really makes any good TV anymore. Um, everything is loaded with identity politics, with um, tokenism, with whatever nonsense. No one is, wants to tell good stories. Everyone wants to pu push a political agenda and it just gets boring really quickly, which is probably the reason why stuff like um, Squid Games and stuff was so good and was so well received because it was an original premise and it was something that didn't kind of pander and didn't try to appease a certain group it just tried to tell a cool and interesting story and people kind of rallied behind it and i hope we do this we, and i hope season four of stranger things is an indication to other um production companies other writers out there other investors out there that people are dying for good series so watch they don't care about messages they don't care about all that nonsense they want something that they can root for something that can take them out um, take them away from their daily um, struggles and daily hassles and stuff something they can unplug from and just watch as pure unbridled entertainment and this we got in spades so if you haven't watched it already i definitely recommend <clears throat> that you check out stranger things season four apologies for the little uh, home there i really really enjoyed it next one list here we're going to talk about quickly, this news is obviously breaking in the UK. If you're not in the UK, you probably don't give a crap. But this is courtesy of The Guardian. Chris Pincher, one of the former members of the Tory government, um, MP, sorry, has been accused of sexual misconduct, sexual assault, whatever it may be, over the years. And for whatever reason... Um, Boris Johnson thought in his infinite wisdom that it would be um, it would be kind of wise to promote him into a job knowing full well that he was accused of what he was accused of and now it's transpired that he has been accused of more ac accusations and now off the back of that two of his kind of high I would say profile um, employees or team members in terms of Savage Javid and Rishi Sunak have resigned which is a real big thing because for the most part Boris Johnson has been able to kind of I feel like get away with murder really for the most part, right? He seems to be able to kind of withstand any sort of public controversy. Um, obviously, the major one being the stuff with the COVID lockdown and the fact that it was now been revealed that he and the number 10 um, offices and his government in general hosted many, many parties when we were, were in the kind of most severe lockdown, when, we, when it was being threatened that if you were hosting parties that you'd be fined, you know, upwards of £10,000. The whole entire Tory government were doing parties behind closed doors having champagne eating cheese and just being absolute cunts while the rest of the country were having to basically you know be alone at home without seeing family members for the best part of what two years or something like that right absolutely insane and he somehow managed to survive that um because he just survived it right because it feels like no one in his government really wants to stand up to him or maybe for the most part they're all just as bad as him and if they try to get behind they just try to kind of throw stones then it might you know kind of end up backfiring on them and people might be finding out about their secrets but regardless this is a quick timeline of the allegations against chris pincher because i think it's quite interesting because i find it interesting that this is a thing that is giving him the most pressure I, I didn't feel this much pressure off the back of the whole like covid lockdown parties thing so this is interesting to see but it's also interesting to see that this isn't i don't feel like being dealt with the same level of severity that if it was involving females and it goes to show how there are such a double standards when it comes to um, sexual assault concerning men. For the most part, people don't tend to really care. Um, but people are trying to care about this because I guess they want the ulterior motive of getting Boris out of office, it feels like. But if you really get down to the brass necks of it and the raw details, it feels like it's a bit of an afterthought because essentially he was still given a job. He was still an MP after his allegations anyway. So anyway, Guardian timeline. November 2017. Pincher quit the whip's office after former professional rower and Tory activist Alex Story accused him of making unwanted passes, massaging his neck while telling him he would go far in a party and acting like a pound shop Harvey Weinstein towards the, him in 2001. He denied the allegations and the party investigation later cleared Pincher of wrongdoing. So already there's a red flag there, right? In 2017. 2019 in July, Pincher was brought back into the government by Boris Johnson after a period of the backbenches becoming a foreign officer 
office minister and then a housing minister. So two years after those allegations, Boris thought, you know what, fuck that, let's bring him back in. He's good at his job, even though he likes to touch up men, um, you know, unwantingly, and he seems to be horny 24-7. Let's bring him back in regardless. And this is also, think of it, it's also the back, this is also the back of the other MP being caught in flipping the House of Commons watching porn and shit. Like, absolutely mad. Anyway, we continue. February 2022. Pincher was made deputy chief whip by Johnson. The Sunday Times reports that a male Tory MP informed the whip's office at the same time that Pincher had made unwanted passes at him. So already he hasn't learned his lesson from 2017 and he's still making passes at people that don't want to be touched. Right? Um, made unwanted pass at him. Pincher has denied acting inappropriately. Um, Conservative MPs have also said they informed their whips about general concerns about Pincher's conduct. I also find it interesting that they keep using this thing unwanted pass you never hear this language when it comes to women whenever it's a sexual assault sexual misconduct allegation it always feels as if the guy was like in the bushes and he jumped out at the person right and kind of jumped on them and sort of pinned them to the ground and tried to do whatever you never get the you never get the story that oh no they were actually he was actually trying to hook up with this person read the signals wrong and then he got in a bit of a bind it's always no this person jumped out of a fucking bush but when it comes to men, it's an unwanted pass. No, it's not unwanted pass. Like, this is a professional environment. It's a workplace. Why are you even making a pass at me in the first place? This is, this is no place to do that sort of nonsense. Keep your hands and your eyes to yourself and leave me alone. But anyway, we continue. Pinterest denied that acting appropriately. Conservative MPs have also said that they informed their whips about the general concerns about Pinterest's conduct. The announcement of his promotion was delayed by referral to the Cabinet Office Propriety and Office Unit to investigate the allegations against Pincher had been reported by the whip. So they already knew something was up. They already knew they already did a bit of a fell part, but they still continued on. July 20, sorry, June 29, um, 2022, Pincher attended an event in the Conservative Friends of Cyprus at the Carlton Club in Piccadilly. Uh-oh, three drinks involved. He was accused by two men of drunkenly groping them and had to be put in a taxi home. One of them told another whip, Sarah Dines, who reported the matter to a chief whip, Chris Henton Harris. Now, if this happens as an isolated incident, fair enough, right? But off the back of this in 2017, you'd imagine if somebody has to be put in a cab home forcibly, drunk out of their mind after randomly trying to touch up two random guys, this might be the end. You should be calling them the next day and saying, hey, please hand me your resignation. This isn't the place for you. Let's do this properly. It doesn't happen. The 3rd of June, Heaton Harris investigated the incident the Pincher offered his resignation and the son reported on the evening that he had resigned as Deputy Chief Whip and Pincher released a letter saying he had got drunk and embarrassed himself. <laughs> Johnson declined to suspend him from the party saying the matter was closed. So he, he resigns for being a sex pest, for being a creep, but Johnson still doesn't want to, you know, fire him from the, from the flipping um, from the Tory government. Number 10 deputy, and this is July 1st, uh, a deputy Pitcher post spokesperson insisted that the Prime Minister was not aware of the allegations against Pitcher at the time and promoting him in February. So you're telling me he didn't know about the allegations? Oh, God almighty, he's such a liar. And now, of course, we're at where we're at, where now he's saying that he does know that he was aware of it, but it was a little too late. And now, off the back of that, we also got news here that these two main dudes in Tory's government or in you know Boris's government have now decided to resign because, as uh, Richie Sunak said, um, earlier on today enough is enough and I just I don't know man I don't know enough may not be enough he might end up surviving this again but I just feel like as a dude it's just interesting to see how different stuff concerning sexual assault with men gets treated as opposed to women because I don't think anybody would have a job let alone be able to kind of get promoted if they had so many allegations of misconduct against women in their workplace against them if it was a man but the fact that he was able to get away with it so much I, if anything, is a bad look on the government, is a bad look on our society. And it also shows that maybe behind closed doors, there is some really, really messed up stuff that goes on in number 10, that that is allowed, that people kind of, you know, turn a blind eye to it. It's absolutely heinous, man. Absolutely heinous. Hope he gets suspended. Hope he gets fired, whatever it may be. And I hope this is the end of the Boris Johnson's government because it just feels like he runs an absolute shit show of a party, in it? Really does, man. Has the most deplorable people. But maybe it's not a shit show. Because I'm thinking about it at the moment, right? Just come in my head. Pause. Um, maybe Boris Johnson's government isn't really deplorable. Maybe this is just what governments really are like. But because whatever for every reason this conservative government is just so unscrupulous, they're so unapologetic, they have no shame. 
they kind of wear it with some sort of pride that they're pieces of shit, similar to like Donald Trump. You remember when Donald Trump was like, you know, president of the United States? A lot of the thing that I saw with Donald Trump's presidency was more so that he gave dickheads or he gave pieces of shit an excuse to be pieces of shit. Like people that always wanted to kind of go to, you know, left wing um, rallies and antagonize people and just be cunts about stuff. They were finally got given an excuse with Donald Trump. Like they finally got given the excuse to kind of be, really be their true selves. And I feel like maybe the Tory government isn't actually feels full of pieces of shit. It's just full of people who are actually being honest and not trying to pretend like they're good people. Do you know what I mean? We're pieces of shit. We're in government you know, you voted us in, haha, ha, too late, you can't vote us out anymore, after another whatever many years it may be, and even then, we're still going to have jobs forever, haha, ha, shame on you, and we keep it moving. So maybe that's the case, I'm not really too sure, but either way, it would be nice, as just a regular civilian, to see that the rules do apply to others, because I don't think if you were a, the CEO of a regular corporation, and you managed to overlook your... Um, new hire or promoted persons um, checkered sexual assault allegations passed and then it came to light I don't think you'd have a job you'd also have to walk you know what I mean if that person walked you have to walk too because you approved of their promotion knowing full well of what they'd done in the past but you know unfortunately life isn't fair so most likely Boris will still have a job and everything will just keep continuing on because there'll be another tragedy that'll turn around there'll be another tragedy around the corner that people will be paying attention to and everyone will forget about this unfortunately it is what it is isn't it moving on again to news concerning my favorite football club in the world Manchester United and the ongoing soap opera that doesn't seem to ever end we got this news courtesy of Daily Mail which is just broken on social media now. And I think there's been an update concerning Harry Gregorio's team clarifying that it was a team thing and not actually him that pressed it. But regardless, this just further highlights just how much of a shit show we are as a club, and as a football team, as an organisation, whatever it may be. So the headline is as follows. Manchester United fans spot Captain Harry Maguire liking an Instagram post about one-to-way Cristiano, Cristiano Ronaldo being upset at a 25% wage cut. So was it him or one of his social media team? Man United fans have slammed Harry Maguire and questioned the captain's credentials after it appeared in like he appeared to like an Instagram post about Christian Ronaldo's anger at the club's rumoured 25% wage cut. There had already been calls for the England defender to lose the permanent armband after the difficult season and those cries have now increased following this apparent social media blunder. Sport Bible posted a picture of Ronaldo alongside a caption explaining that he reportedly upset about 25% wage cut given to Man United players after their failure to qualify for the Champions League. And you can see the post here, it's taken from Sport Bible's Instagram account. It's got Ronaldo's face here shouting, and it says Cristiano Ronaldo is reportedly upset with 25% wage cut received by all players when Man United failed to qualify for the Champions League next season. The five-time Ballon d'Or winner will now see his 480-a-week salary reduced to 360 as United pay. Sorry, as United play in the Europa League, right? And of course, you see Harry Maguire's um, Instagram account. There, Harry Maguire 93 had liked that post, right? And it's the two of them there on the pitch. Now. The funny thing about this is that, for me personally, just speaking about this on the open, it's just a weird faux pas because, no, let's start from the open, let's start from the top. I find it really interesting that Harry Maguire is one of the most hated United players to ever have worn the shirt in such a short period of time. He hasn't been in the club that long, he doesn't have a big personality really, he's not really a um, dirty player on the pitch, and for the most part... The reason why he's hated is because of how bad people think he is as a player and how maybe overinflated his transfer fee was. It has, but then, of course, his personality also and how his family acts on social media hasn't really helped things either. His family, I don't really have that much bad things to say about because I think regardless of what you think of him as a player, as a person, I think his family are well within their rights to, 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 you know, to shout from the rafters of how much they support him, how much they love him and highlight all the good about him because he's their family member. That makes complete sense. But I just don't see how he doesn't understand how he's perceived online, even if he doesn't agree with it, and try to maybe temper it so that it can alleviate some of the pressure that is on him on the football pitch. Because that's part of the reason why he gets so much pelters or so much unnecessary attention on the pitch. Because people generally don't like him as a person. 
And a lot of it has to come with his antics online, his comments, celebrations, the things he doesn't say, you know, when he doesn't come out and give interviews, when the United get drubbed, you know, he's not nowhere to be found. And then suddenly when United win, there he is talking about performances and stuff. And then, you know, basically saying that he's not here to analyze the game and all this sort of nonsense, whatever and crappy. But then the other thing about it as well, it's interesting is that in terms of the dynamic between Christian Ronaldo and Harry Maguire, it was fairly obvious as soon as Ronaldo signed for the club that there would be an issue between the both of them because most United fans who are sensible didn't think Harry Maguire should have ever got the captain's armband. Whether you think Harry Maguire is worth the, the money he was uh, purchased for, whether you think he played well for a period of time, whether you think the criticism against him is a little bit unwarranted, a little bit over the top, no United fan really would sense sat there and thought Harry Maguire would be a good pick for a captain. Now, it's not his fault because United are in a bit of a unique position where they kind of exhausted the, all their options for captains and they only had to give it to him because they couldn't give it to Paul Bob because of this contract dispute and the fact they didn't sign a new contract. They couldn't give it to De Gea because they stripped him of it once before. Like, we basically put ourselves into a corner where there weren't really many options available and we had to only give it to somebody who maybe was the marquee signing, leading from the back, England, whatever it may be, right? It made complete sense in that way. But in hindsight, it was a bad decision. It was also a bad decision to then sign Ronaldo and to not clarify what the decision was. Because I feel like the club basically fucked Maguire over in that respect. Signing someone like Ronaldo of his calibre and his kind of personality would automatically warrant him to get the captain's armband because of what he's achieved in the game. So there maybe should have been a conversation with the club in the same way the club had a conversation with Martial when Ibrahimovic signed and were like, no, we need Mar Ibrahimovic to be our number nine so that we can sell loads of shirts. Martial, you're going to be here for a while anyway. Just take the number 11 for now. Give Ibrahim number nine and we can keep moving. Even though, you know, Martial was pissed about it commercially and all that sort of stuff behind the scenes just to kind of get it out of the way it kind of made sense there should have been some sort of conversation between the both of Harry Maguire's camp and Cristiano Ronaldo's camp like okay cool I'm going to put the story out that how I went to to like you know um purposely or of my own volition um rescind the captain's armband because you know a Ballon d'Or winner was coming into a club and I wanted us him to lead us into a Champions League and into kind of other glories so I gave him the captain's armband for the next two years under the proviso once he leaves I'll get it back again or something along those lines the fact that it didn't happen and they left Maguire and others to do it themselves in the changing room and then we also started to play really badly and then of course we have all the clicks we already have established in the changing room between some of the English players some of the Portuguese players some of the players out there since before flipping Oli whatever it may be right all those things kind of then added to the cluster of situation we've got at the moment where essentially it looks like they clearly don't get along so it's not surprising that because they don't get along that Harry Maguire would see this post and forget that he was Harry Maguire and like it because he definitely agrees with it. He definitely does agree that maybe in his head, he feels like Ronaldo's taking the piss out of the club. Maybe in his head, he feels like Ronaldo thinks he's running the club. And maybe in his head, he feels like Ronaldo essentially undermined his authority and maybe negatively affected his, you know, um, his uh, standard of play when he was playing during the season. I can see that happening because Maguire is definitely an eternal victim. He doesn't accept any personal responsibility for his play. Anytime you've seen him again interviewed and someone kind of presses him on him, I think a recent interview that really pissed everybody off, that pissed me off, the one where he said something along the lines of, oh, I keep getting picked so I can't be bad, was an absolutely idiotic thing to say in, a, you know, in, in an interview. Obviously, the interview prior to that went into something along the lines of, oh, I'm not here to analyse the game. Like, just an absolute cretin of a man. So it wouldn't surprise me if... Behind closed doors, he absolutely does blame Cristiano Ronaldo's arrival for his poor form and for the fact that no one likes him in terms of the fan base. Now, the long and short of it is, as United captain, you can't be doing this. The fact that he did this on a public platform, using his Instagram account, and the fact that now his team are trying to come back around and now and say, oh, he didn't do it, and it was a team decision or a team thing that did it or an intern that did it, it's bullshit. Because when players like things that we that are non-controversial or like things that are kind of banterish or whatever it may be, people laugh about it, take screenshot about it, and they kind of enjoy the positive kind of affirmation and feedback they get from it. The moment what they like is a bit controversial and maybe not so something they should be liking, suddenly it's an intern's decision or intern's fault. I think the fact that he's done this should be grounds enough for him to get the captain's arm by a strip from him anyway. I think it would have happened regardless because I think at the moment, the fact that there hasn't been any clarification that he's going to stay as captain is probably proof to me 
that most likely Eric Ten Hag is going to pick his own captain anyway. You know, because there's a lot of, you know, talk around his name. There's a lot of rumours. Um, of course, you know, he came off the back of that poor season. If you really wanted to kind of set a sort of precedent and put your flag in the ground and say, hey, this is how we're going to move from now on, you just come out and say, yeah, Harry Maguire is my captain. Um, he's a leader. I see him as an inf in influential part of the team and the squad, integral member of the squad, whatever it may be. And we can't wait for a new season so you can kind of prove it really wrong, whatever it may be. That didn't happen. So the fact that that didn't happen shows me that most likely, if there hasn't been the decision made already, there's definitely some conversations about who should be the captain going forward. Now, is it wise to give the captain's armband to Ronaldo for one season, knowing full well he's going to retire or maybe go to another club or go to Splash of Sport in Lisbon at the end of next season? Probably not. But <coughs> unfortunately, this is what happens when you sign a calibre of player like Cristiano Ronaldo. When you sign players of this sort of ilk, what you end up doing is that you end up essentially making a rod for your own back. Well, let me try and get my flipping tablets because I'm, I'm flipping over here. I think like an absolute savage because I didn't take my intelligence savage. But essentially, that's what you end up doing. You end up making a rod for your own back once you start signing players like this because they demand a different level of treatment, a different level of attention, a different level of care, and in some cases, indulgence. And now that Ronaldo, because again, the time of Harry Maguire is fucking awful. Off the back of Ronaldo, essentially telling the club that he wants to leave, <clears throat> this is such bad timing because the club clearly don't want him to go because if you take a hit on the Champions League money and you're playing in Europa League, but then you have Ronaldo to sell shirts, you might be able to offset some of the losses that you're going to incur. But you don't want to lose Ronaldo and also not have Champions League football if you're a commercially minded club like United. Other clubs that just care about sporting achievement wouldn't give a crap, right? After the first season that Ronaldo was here and we didn't finish in the Champions League spot and knowing Ronaldo wants to still play at the highest level and win trophies, it should have been just a, hey, thanks for coming back. Thanks for the memories. Thanks for, you know, rekindling our love for the club again. Shake hands, keep it moving and you roll. But the fact that Ronaldo, the fact that Man United aren't that club anymore, I don't see the club or the people on the board letting Ronaldo go. And I also don't see this ending well for Harry Maguire because they're going to indulge Ronaldo way more than they're ever going to indulge him, even though they spent 80 million hard-earned great British pounds on him in the first place, Harry Maguire. So it's a real effed up situation. But again, for me, like I said, I'm just intrigued by it because I feel like Harry Maguire hasn't been at a club that long and somehow he's ended up being more unlike than somebody like a Maran Fellaini or something like like, you know, and Fellaini I absolutely hated, but mostly because he was fucking shit. And he represented everything that I hated about United at that time, right? Mediocrity, um, uh, it will make do, just flub flubbering mess of a, of a situation of a player. But even him, at the end of it, I kind of ended up, in you know, endearing myself to him because he was only doing his best anyway. Do you know what I'm saying? It wasn't his fault he got signed. It wasn't his fault he got keep, he kept getting played. It kind of is what it was. But Harry Maguire somehow, I don't know how he done it. Like he went from being just some, um, you know, run on the mill centre back at Leicester City, who people kind of rate, don't get me wrong. Then as soon as he comes to Man United, he's under the big lights, people immediately think he's a cunt. And it hasn't stopped and it's probably going to get worse, especially once we start the new season without Ronaldo. It probably will end up getting worse for him going forward. So um, prayers and thoughts go out to all those guys. But again, Eric Ten Hag has walked into an absolute supper of, of a club. Things are probably going to get worse before they get better. And yeah, man, I just can't wait for all this stuff to fucking be over for now. I really, really can't. Because it's fucking annoying, man. I can't be... Oh. It's always some sort of nonsense happening with flipping them. Um, with um, England. Oh, sorry, with Man United, sorry. Might as well be England, anyway. Anyway, moving on. Quick video here, courtesy of an Instagram account called Music Connoisseur, which is not spelt the right way, but remove. And it's a clip taken from the ZZ Mill show, which I don't think... Which is really strange to me, personally. Because I feel like this should be common sense. But for some reason, this has really sort of captured people's imagination. So far, it's got 50,000 views. And everyone seems to really resonate with the message. But I can't understand why. Because this seems like common sense to me. And I also feel like if you think this way, it probably says more about you than anything. That you'd be sitting there legitimately thinking that you should have your life in order by the age of 25 or under is legitimately insane. You might get some you might get thoughts of or feelings of envy 
um, or somewhat FOMO when you're seeing people that you're your age out there enjoying their lives, doing things that you would l wish and hope that you could do or afford to do. That's one thing. But to legitimately think that you should have your life in order, like in terms of a job, relationship, a good friendship circle by the age of 25 is legitimately insane. I don't think most people have that way of thinking. I think unless maybe you work in like the entertainment industry or you want to be an influencer or you want to work or you want to be a public figure of some sort or whatever it may be or a content creator maybe you might have that kind of thing in the back of your head like oh if you see a kid has, that has a youtube account and he has like two million fucking subs or something maybe that might make you feel bad about your account that you only have two but i also don't think most people think that anyway because that's a bit of an anomaly like the kid's reviewing toys he's 10 years old he's cute as a button the videos are probably uh, probably really highly produced by a, an external production company whatever and there's reasons why people are where they are but it doesn't necessarily mean because that person's got two million that somehow your two is insignificant and doesn't matter it just means you're in different journeys but yeah i find this clip really insane it's a bit common sense it didn't make any sense but it's a bit it's common sense and kind of pointing out the obvious but people seem to enjoy it so i'm going to play it for you and then hopefully you can kind of see where i'm coming from in terms of this being a bit of a duh moment i remember when i turned 25 i had like this mid quarter life crisis right and i no genuinely and i would cry on the i remember one oh, wow. time i broke down on the bus because i genuinely didn't know what i was doing with my life i was like turning 25 i thought i was going to be halle berry it wasn't happening and I was like, I went to drama school, did all of these things that I thought was gonna like be, I was gonna be this person. It wasn't happening. I was working in a job that I wasn't happy with really. Mm. And I just didn't know what to do. And now when I look back at 33, because I'm still young, like yeah, yeah. the thing is, even though socials will make you feel like you're getting older, yeah, even yeah. at 25, the way you're speaking is almost like you're hitting 40. Like <laughs> I've found myself now and I've gone through all these things. <laughs> it's like, bro, you're still 25. Like you've yeah, still got all yeah, this yeah, time no, to like live. I agree, I agree. But socials and so, like the way the world is moving, it makes us all feel we're older than we actually are. Yeah, yeah, but when yeah, I look yeah. back at me at 25 as a 33 year old, I'm like, wow, like I wish I just enjoyed my time as a 25 year old or a 23 year old or whatever. And it was, and I just lived in that moment. Do you get what yeah, I'm saying? Because I you look back and you think, oh my God, I actually, I didn't know who I was at 25 and I'm glad I didn't know who I was because I got to experiment. I got to yeah, figure it yeah, out, do different fun. things. Okay, mm. I traveled and I did all these different things. So you've still got loads of time. Yeah, I believe Loads so. and loads of time, but it's so. good. It's now, the one thing that I would maybe give her a point on is that maybe nowadays, maybe kids do sound a little bit too mature for their own good. But I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I think nowadays, because of how, how would you say? Because of how professional everything is, like from even from to being an influencer, right? Things are, things, it's professional. I'm sure there's guides out there that tell you how to like, up, how to take pictures, how to write your captions, when to upload, um, what type of content calendar to have, how to reach out to sponsors, what deals to sign, how to structure your deals, what manager to sign to, what agent to sign to. People approach things in a very professional manner. Like there's probably kids out there who are legitimately like 10 years old who are like, yeah, my job, I want to be a vlogger. I want to be a YouTuber. I want to have a content house. I want to you know, start a boxing promotion thing, whatever it may be. There's probably kids out there who have those kind of ambitions. So if they have that kind of ambition and it's a very clear defined goal in a very professional kind of industry, of course, your kind of actions and the way you speak are going to, should be mirroring what you're trying to basically achieve or should be maybe trying to get you closer to what you're trying to achieve. It makes complete sense. So I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing in that regard. But I also don't think that the kids at that age when they're 25 are legitimately sitting there thinking, oh, because I see this guy online or on TV who's smashing it and driving a Bentley and dating all these exotic women and going to all these far-flung places, that it somehow means that me working in a, you know, in this kind of uh, pack, picking and packing job in some warehouse in the middle of Ilford is somehow insignificant. No, it's just a part of your journey. And it's also a different journey. And it's also doesn't demean the fact that people having regular jobs is also something to be heralded because i feel like sometimes there's too much onus i feel like placed on having these sort of like fun content jobs and not enough onus placed on people just living and existing and having the ability to pay their bills go on a holiday or two go out for a couple of meals uh, be able to buy themselves a pair of trainers take out their parents for something to eat give their mum some money for bills like all those things are amazing if you're able to do that it's really an achievement like i can say for myself like you know it took me ages bloody 
ages to get my first job, my first actual job. It took me so long to get. And I only got the job because of my dad's friend who happened to be a janitor at a flipping bowling alley, ended up putting in a good word for me. And I ended up working at this place called Hollywood Bowl, right? And I was flipping serving chicken nuggets and, and making fucking hot dogs and stuff and cooking chips and stuff. And I couldn't cook for stuff. And again, it's not cooking. I couldn't cook for shit. And I know it's not cooking, but for somebody that couldn't even make an egg to go to somewhere where I'm suddenly now frying chips and making nuggets and making hot dogs and all that good stuff, that was a big step for me, especially because it was a workplace too. I had to be there at a certain time. I had to work with a team, I had interpersonal skills, all that self-motivation because I was legitimately doing it on my own. But it really was a... Um, a liberating and freeing experience because it finally allowed me to have my own pocket money because I never had my own pocket money money I always had to kind of ask for my parents and growing up my, you know we didn't really have that much money and I always felt guilty about asking money for to go out in places or sometimes I wouldn't ask at all and I'll just go to places hungry or with nothing in my pocket and just hope something would work out like loads of stuff happened a lot so to have the ability to just have some money in my pocket to be able to go to a shop and buy myself a pack of crisp or whatever it may be and not have to buy the Tesco value flipping biscuits was a big deal for me a real big deal and I cherished it but it also didn't mean that because I couldn't afford to go to you know Amsterdam for the weekend with my friends that somehow now the job wasn't good enough suddenly it didn't mean that I'll still get FOMO and I still wish I was there but it didn't necessarily equate that my job was, was now irrelevant or insignificant because those guys have better jobs that they can go do other stuff or if my friends have a uh, if my friends had a job where they were mostly working in the industry that they went into kind of work, working professionally going forward it didn't mean because I was working retail that it suddenly kind of you know my job when what I was doing was insignificant. No, that's not the case. It's just a different part of my journey. And hopefully I get there in the end. But sometimes if you want to stay there, just work for working sake. Like I have friends now, even at my big age, who are working in retail. Some of them are just store assistants. Some of them are supervisors. Some of them are floor managers. And some of them just work on the weekends as kind of extra pay. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. It really isn't. And this whole figuring your life out stuff, there is nothing really to figure out. As long as you have a good circle of friends, you have some good relationships, you have um, meaningful things that you do outside of work, that should be the basis of a good life, especially now in a post-pandemic world. I think we basically got to see at the height of the pandemic when we weren't able to even go outside and grab ourselves some chicken nuggets and flipping sorry some chicken wings and chips or we weren't able to go and hug our parents or we weren't able to go and you know shop freely in, sh in flipping supermarkets without having to stand 10 meters behind people we saw that all we need is the bare necessities that we're missing out on just contact with people which is why we were going to parks and having coffees and stuff and taking walks and whatnot because we we're just missing that human connection human touch and the moment that freedoms got relaxed people were running to brighton they were going to places in manchester to liverpool it didn't matter if they couldn't go abroad they just wanted to go somewhere and hang out with their family and friends to have a good time and i feel like now in a post-pandemic world we shouldn't lose sight of that and 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 kind of forget that the main thing that we all wanted was the ability to just be around our friends and family and live a somewhat quote-unquote good life. And that's what we're doing right now, right? We're living that. We're doing that at the moment. We're able to kind of, you know, some of us are able to work from home. Some of us have a split work from home schedule. Some of us have, you know, the ability to maybe work two or three jobs at the time. Some of us have the ability to maybe have a promotion because people left or people got fired, whatever it may be, right? You're in a much better position probably now than you were before in a pandemic or not. Or maybe you're clear on where you want to go. If that's the case then just, you know, adding some bits here and there in terms of being able to have, you know, meaningful things that you do outside of work, improving your relationships, personal and romantic, that might make things better. But this idea that figuring life out is the be and end all is really redundant, I feel like. And if anything will end up putting you in a position where you end up being depressed and moody because... I don't think there's such a thing, personally for me, I don't think there is such a thing as figuring your life out. I feel like figuring life out is basically living a somewhat good and honest life, which is somehow doing right by you and your close ones around you. And that should be about it. Everything else should be a bonus. Even if you want to be an influencer or whatever it may be, I don't think the fact that you can't reach 100,000 followers should be something that should kind of, you know, destroy you and mean that life is not meaningful anymore and she's gonna jump off a bridge no it's nice to achieve a goal it's nice to set out you know wanting something and achieve it of course but this idea that your whole life 
an identity and sort of dreams aspiration should be wrapped around the idea that you're not an influence that, that you you know you haven't reached this influence status that you want to reach or they haven't got that many followers or you haven't got that many views it's just really insane and really redundant and i hope most kids aren't thinking that way now and i don't think they are anyway in general but i did find it really humorous and really laughable that this is somehow capturing everyone's imagination they're like yeah that's so true i get it. i guess like, this is common sense man you shouldn't be thinking that 25 is any age to kind of make it and be successful in any walk of life in general anyway it's usually the exception that people that are successful at that age and the exceptions aren't the rule ever in life ever 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 as long as you're doing something that you enjoy and that you love anyway that should be part of the enjoyment or that should be the, ma the majority of the reason why you get out of bed in the first place it shouldn't be because you're trying to attain some lofty goal and once you don't achieve it suddenly life becomes meaningless that's not how you should go about life in my opinion but again what do i know Moving on, we've got news courtesy of Mixmag regarding a new club opening up in London, which is very, very, very interesting, especially for me, um, considering that I'm an absolute addict of the nightlife and I'm an absolute addict of clubs and addict of techno, addict of dance music in general. And I'd love to see these new spaces popping up all over London because I still think at the moment, even though we have some of the best clubs in London, and I think overall in terms of diversity of musical genres and different sort of club nights and promotions circuits and you know people behind the scenes even though i think we have some of the best things here i still feel like there's things missing that sh could be done better that would make that would help make london the premier premier destination for clubbing i feel like anyway it continues the team behind Printworks, Depot Mayfield and Tobacco Docks, Broadwick Live and LWE have joined forces for a new space, The Beams, a coming experience which will open up in October. Obviously, The Beams, I'm assuming, because it's got beams all over it. Makes sense. Situated in a warehouse that is once part of the Tate & Lauk factory, it, The Beams will span across 55,000 square feet of space. Oh, Tate & Lauk, that's next to um, Canning Town, isn't it? Or like City Airport, it is. Oh, wow. That's near where I grew up. The club will be located in a bustling East London close to London City Airport, providing an industrial space for revelers to let loose and enjoy music. I really hope, again, this is, why I, this is what didn't really happen with Fold, but you know, maybe Fold's my own issue for not getting involved in the first place. Ooh, double entendre there. But I really do hope that these sort of clubs go out their way to make some sort of program or initiative where they include local artists and DJs because I've literally grown up around this area. I've been into this music for the most of my life and to be able to play here will be an absolute privilege and absolute honor, but it'll absolutely tie in with everything that's around it, right? And I'm sure there's other DJs and people that live around the area too that I have no idea even exists because I'm not, I, I don't necessarily hang around there too much anymore. But it would be cool to kind of have that tie in where you have this place that's situated in this really interesting part of East London with loads of history dating back to the First World War. And then you tie it in with people who actually live in and around this area, who have ties around the area too, who get to kind of play there. And, you know, it's a kind of it's a cool, interesting marketing story. Instead of just going to pick and book people like Amelia Lenz and Carl Cox could play, it's just boring. But they don't do that because I guess, you know, maybe it doesn't garner the same level of attention in terms of ticket sales and whatnot going forward. But I really would like it if they did that. They have some sort of thing, some sort of outreach program, maybe some sort of de designated club night or something that they did. Maybe one one thing, maybe a residency program if they wanted to do so, where they try to promote and uplift and platform local DJs and artists like myself. Because I really do think that's what's missing with these sort of places because it feels like they just get plopped there. You have all these external hips is coming in from all over the place foreign people from outside of east london but then you have nothing that's actually tied to the area that's that's local nothing everything's kind of people from all far found places and i hate that it pisses me off a little bit i gotta be honest um it continues anyway um, the beams will operate using a hybrid multi-use complex just as other venues developed by Broadwick Live. It will offer customizable space during the week, contemporary industrial uses such as construction, film and art, photo shoots, corporate and brand events, exhibitions and fashion shows. That's the only sad thing about clubs in London, isn't it? And about just the, the business of setting up a nightclub. It's so expensive, I must, I would imagine, to run a nightclub, to pay the rent, operating costs, whatever it may be, that if you have a space such as the beams, you kind of owe it to yourself and your bank balance and the future of your kids 
and the ability to pay your mortgage and the fact that you don't want to get divorced from your partner, you kind of owe it yourself to try to make use of the space during the week by hiring it out to film companies, production companies, blah, 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 blah to film adverts and whatnot, whatnot, just to kind of help you to keep the, the books balanced because you can't rely on just making money purely on being a nightclub. Now, you could say the same thing about Bergheim because they had this massive exhibition there during lockdown. They have, you know, <coughs> live music type shows during the week. They sometimes let people to film stuff indoors there. So I'm sure they hire it out. But for the most part, you could say 70% of Bergheim's income or those sort of kind of clubs, right? These sort of mega clubs mostly comes down from what they program on a week to week basis. It's not because of, you know, anything else. Um, and it would be nice if we had stuff, to, we had the same thing in terms of clubs in the UK. Because I feel like if that was, if that happened, I feel like the lineups would also reflect it. I feel like if you had a club that would, could survive on just having really solid club nights alone, you would see far more interesting and diverse lineups on the, uh, on, at the clubs. But because they can't, that's why you see the same old regurgitated names again and again, because those are the ones that sell tickets. When the space is being used for club nights and weekend organizers are keen to make it a music and cultural space, Broadwick Live and LWE have announced that they will be putting on 12 shows over the autumn spanning the opening night on October 1st to December the 17th. These shows will give Londoners something to look forward to over the winter clubbing season of 2022 as organizers promise that the lineup and production will cement as London's ones, London's best clubbing experience. Oh wow, so they're really going for it. The booms will be an outcome of tight cooperation between Broadwick Live, Newham Council, Royal Docks and Project in order to make make sure the club will have a positive influence on social economic area so for sure the sound would be pretty shit um unless it's far away from places so if they're having all this stuff about liaison with councils and stuff so i don't know it's, it feels like the sound might be terrible but it also might feel like it will be something similar to like a print works operation where they might have it set up in a way where they have maybe shuttle buses that ferry people from certain places there might be a heavy security presence to make sure people don't linger around um, there might be a specific route that they have to kind of enter and leave the club they'll do certain things to make sure that it sort of causes as less damage as possible to a local environment or neighborhood so people don't complain doesn't get shut down Speak about the upcoming opening of the beams aj uh, jaram the director of music at broadwalk live says we're excited to finally announce our inaugural music program at the beams in collaboration with lwe the partnership with two of london's foremost promoters and music creators feels truly significant as it is a reunion of the ambitious team who launched printworks oh yeah true so who's doing printworks now if they if they're not doing it anymore who's doing the program around printworks is it just broadwick live no it's not that who is that then? who is it doing that? i don't know huh so it's AWA and Broadwick are responsible for doing, responsible for launching Primus in this current iteration. So I wonder who's currently doing the program of it now. Huh. Musically, we will lean into the partnerships programming and an eclectic series of day and night events over 12 consecutive Saturdays. We will be featuring top tier names, see, emerging talent, mm, let's see, across various sound styles and genres with the broad sphere of house techno disco and everything that lies between. We look forward to introducing our audiences to this exceptional raw industrial setting full of character and situated in an untouched part of London. Please get people from East London to play there, guys. The venue will be housed near the public transport amenities and will be easily accessible by DLR via Ponton Dock Station. Bloody hell, man. I used to go to, like, this is like my ends. The full details of the deal will be announced on July 5th. As now, the Beams is now undergoing planning stages. Okay, so July 5th. So we should have um, information on it now if you go to the site. Let's see. Actually, they, don't have a, they have an Instagram account, right? Where is it? The Beams. Where is it? The... the, the Oh, I don't have it. Okay, let's see if they got it. They should have it available already so we can check it out. Um, it's called The Beams, right? The Beams... London. There we go. Let's see if they got it up already. Should we have it up already? Yeah, there you go. Cool. Okay, no details as of yet. They said the fifth, but we don't really have any much information. Five days ago. Yeah, hey, there you go. Nothing really else has been produced for it, but it looks interesting. It looks like a cool space. Definitely will check it out, of course. Um, but yeah, I'll also like if they do, <clears throat> please end up having some people from the local area, such as myself, able to play there because that would be an excellent tie-in for everything that's going on over there, I think, personally. But will that happen? We don't really know. Let's wait and see in it. Let's wait and see. <coughs> oh, God, my throat. 
Move on. Talk about here. Let's move from this one. Let's move on this one. Where is it? I'll talk about this now. Where is it? Oh, yes, about this. Oh. Have you guys seen these? Social status confirms the release date of the Nike Air Penny. Air, Air Penny Max 1. And they look absolutely banging. Um, really, 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 really good shoes that have been retro. They look absolutely smashing these pennies, man. Like, wow. Obviously, the black and blue pair are definitely the ones that I think I'm going to be definitely more on because these are more f similar to the OGs. But these uh, cream off-white pairs are absolutely hard too. Like, they look so fucking good. This is when I think basketball design was at its peak, personally, for me. Um, that kind of late 90s sort of style. Um, nowadays, not, not so much. Because they have this weird silhouette where they kind of look like a mid, but they also look like a high. But also like a low, do you know, they kind of got that kind of quarter mid style. But obviously if you wear long socks, you can kind of make them look way bigger than what they are, or way longer than what they are itself. But I think these look absolutely incredible, man. What a great, great shoe. Really looking forward to these coming out. Um, <clears throat> so as it follows, is there anything you need to know about the Whitaker Group and the way that it's go about his businesses is the fact that they always go as hard as a kind of storytelling. I was introducing the luxury, da, 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 da. James Whitaker and his team has now landed the social status this moment to shine in his debut in the MX Penny One Reese's Collection with Nike, an initiative designed to spotlight the significance and community experience that occur in school. Um, no be to da, da, da. The online draw and in-person raffle for the social status and Whitaker Group store locations of the shoes will commence on July 2nd. It's already done. Um, a TWG Discord draw will also be available. The entire collection will be scheduled to launch online on July 15th. Both pairs are priced at $190. They look so fucking good though, isn't it? Like, really, really good. What's the date here? They got $190? Yes, it's $190. But they look fucking incredible. I'm, d I'm down for both pairs, to be honest, man. I'd wear the hell out of the creams or the off-whites, whatever the colour that is. But I'd also wear the hell out of that fucking, um, uh, that black pair. I wonder if, looking at them now, I wonder if this bubble style was what they took from the Air Max 2270, which is a surprisingly, which is a shoe I feel like kind of came and went really quickly. I thought the M M Nike Air Max 270 was going to replace the Roshi Run in terms of popularity with just regular normie folks. But it really kind of died quickly in it it didn't really hang around too long um but i do like that kind of back kind of um half crescent or horseshoe type bubble that goes all the way around the only thing i don't like about them especially in the new retros it feels like they don't really let the bubble really expand and look crazy bulbous it's always kind of encased and sort of entrapped i feel like in all this kind of rubber on the outside and obviously that comes from the older days when back in the day you know mx 95s you know with really massive bubbles would always burst and people would always kind of return them so they had to kind of make a compromise i guess but i would like them to figure out something that could allow them to make the bubble look a little bit more exaggerated look make it pop out a bit more so it wasn't in case so much here but overall that's you know, I'm nitpicking a bit because these are just fire. Absolute fire, man. Um, yeah, social status and um, Nike Air Max Penny 1 retro is coming out very, very soon. Um, yeah, check those out if you're that way inclined. Check those out if you're that way inclined. Um, next on the list here, we have news courtesy of Hypebeast again regarding Teddy Santis, what it, what it feels like... Um, undefeated run so far at new balance usa man so far i've not seen a single miss from this guy when it comes to new balance usa ever since he's been appointed what was it crave director or whatnot everything that's come from this guy's hand has been absolute fire i'm actually going to check his instagram quickly and see if he's actually uploading anything new but i remember when i was checking his instagram for new balance i was like god almighty is this guy like just incapable of making bad shoes it sort of reminds me of the early days of like ronnie Fay. Um, remember the guy from fucking um, what's his name the guy from Kif right when he was first doing collaborations he felt like he couldn't miss and not so so far you know as as time would have it and as life would have it he's got a few faux pas here and there but there was a period in time where you know he couldn't miss there wasn't a single shoe that he did that was badly done it was all absolute fire 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 oh, okay Tay Santa's complete Instagram has completely been wiped that's a shame, so we don't have any new stuff here to show you. But regardless, man, these shoes here, whoo, these made in USA 990 V2s, like in terms of colorways, 
in terms of material choices, in terms of finishes, it's just so well done. Like, I love this upper. And I think maybe it's just a picture and how it's been lit up. But essentially, the upper looks like a dark blue, uh, maybe a navy, maybe a black. But whatever they've done with it in terms of the pigment and the hue, somehow, because it's been, because of whatever application has been done to it, it somehow looks like this is all one piece. You know, that's what I like about it. But I'm pretty sure once you wear it in a bit and once you're giving it a few scuffs and dents and whatnot, you'll start seeing a little bit of, um, uh, you'll start seeing some differentiation between the panels, right? Some fraying here, some creasing there. You'll suddenly be able to pick out the panels or start to look a bit different as you start to wear them and progress. <coughs> and then there's also like this solid um, kind of, you know, off-white, outsole or sorry midsole that everyone's doing at the moment this solid but to kind of break up the color i also like the fact that for the most part it's dark colors at the top and then you break it up with the whites in the bottom i like the fact that they've included this mesh here that looks very different than mesh that i've seen before i'm not sure if it's a mesh that's specific to the new balance it kind of looks a little bit more coarse to the touch I like the fact that there's this different material application here. This looks like it might be suede. You've got this sort of like weird new buck tip here towards the back of the heel tab. Like just loads of really crazy cool details that I know were probably slaved over for hours and hours on end that kind of added to this overall silhouette and this, this shoe that make it look great. And another thing too to point out about the 990 V2s or New Balance in general, for me, I always feel like, again, from being a New Balance head, from wearing New Balance for a very long time, that there's something weird about the instep of New Balances. They don't necessarily look as great as the outside, yeah, as the outstep or whatever it's called. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Whereas for whatever reason, this colorway and the way that they finished it, they look completely similar and completely the same on the inside. If anything, you know, you got this extra hit of gray here, but for the most part, they look exactly the same. And I love that. Um, that again, I feel like is a, a, a design consideration, something that definitely went into uh, thinking when he was make, putting these together. And then you've got this here, which I think is a great touch. You've got this encased black sort of like upper with the little white um, hit, of course, outside on the end, so you can see it. But also like this pop here towards the top, where you've got these off-white laces and a completely off-white tongue. But then you've also got this great little detail with the grey sock liner. Like, all these little details I feel like are so amazing and so well done and put together. I like the fact that he didn't do any metal eyelets. So no eyelets at all, which I'm really, uh, I absolutely hate. You can have them at the top there as a little hit. Don't get me wrong, fair enough, do your thing. But I hate metal eyelets in general. I feel like they're absolutely trite. And of course, the the acid test for most sneakers is always a looking down because, you know, even though I love what they look like on the side, I'm never actually going to see them like that day to day. Most of my looking at of these sneakers is always going to be from the top down. And I love that as well on there. Um, what deal have you got in the instep? You've just got um, New Balance Athletic Shoes, Boston um, in the middle. So I do like it as well that there isn't a lot of like Teddy Santis sort of like branding on them. It kind of feels like to me, he's trying to harken back to the golden era of New Balance or trying to maybe remind people like how good of a shoe company New Balance is um, by trying to maybe create these imagined nostalgia pieces right things that you feel like existed back in the day but didn't really exist so with that there's no point of slapping your name on it because you want it to be discernible from afar that these are both new and old shoes and that definitely somebody contemporary and modern touched them with their design hand do you know what i mean that's what it kind of feels like what he's doing at the moment and i think he's done a really really great job man i had my doubts about him being hired in the first place to do these collaborations because i felt like the new balance and amelion duo collaborations were getting a little bit you know repetitive and a little bit boring but he has absolutely smacked out of the park and again i shouldn't have doubted it because say what you want about amelion aod's pricing you can't say the collection is shit Every season, every fucking season, that collection comes out with absolute fire. Fire, 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 fire. But of course, unless you've got, you know, unless you're earning really a, a serious wonga or your parents have got a pretty decent um, allowance to give you, it's fairly hard to justify spending, I don't know, north of £400 on a fucking polo shirt. Do you know what I mean? But there's no denying that these motherfuckers know how to make really cool clothes like legit they make really really cool clothes right there's nothing here on this fucking online store from aod that i wouldn't wear including these loafers everything up here would be worn 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 warm 
fleeces are two two you know two hundred and fifty five pounds for a fleece is a bit mad, you know. 95 quid for shorts is a bit insane but let's not deny that the absolute wares that they make are absolutely incredibly 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 sick let's actually see if they've got a line to see the actual collection yes tw season 22 lookbook and they've got i'm sure they've got the twins again modeling in them who actually look incredible at aod like look at that is there anything in this that you wouldn't wear from this row of absolute fire it's all absolutely amazing all of it so it shouldn't surprise me that the, a person who can make a look as interesting as these, right? Something like that. Would also go to New Balance and feel like, you know, applying his design codes, his design eye, his touch, his flair on a pair of 990s is probably easy. You know what I mean? That's, that, that's light work. If you can do that, if you can do this, you know, doing, um, doing this as a New Balance is not, not, not that hard. So I really shouldn't be surprised, but it is still kind of blowing my mind that this guy is able to do so many great things at New Balance. Like again, I've not seen a single miss. If I quickly search his name on Hypebeast in terms of New Balance, I bet you I won't see a single miss in terms of just looking at the fucking cover images of the stories and stuff and New Balance stuff. Like, look at these shoes. Look, look at that. Another one. For this 990 V1. Like, personally, I've got like the model, but mock mock up wise in terms of colorway in terms of application that is a stellar fucking shoe it's all like what is it combinations of browns and creams and blacks like incredibly well done you got this kind of new buck i don't know what this is it new buck what is this no it's not new buck it is sort of like a brush suede we've got this little, all these little bits hanging off of it <clears throat> different variations of suede you've got a different twist on the end without the border around it you've got whatever this mesh i don't know if it's even mesh or what, not on the thing you've got this black heel tab that kind of breaks everything up like really well done all the colorways there's not a single miss and then the white ones of these 99 v2s are fucking superb if anything they remind me of like a really great example or kind of flip of like a new balance all white air force one it kind of feels like it right the zen gray you remember the kind of classic air force one high zen grays it kind of reminds me of that sort of like classic colorway. Like, really, really well done. Like, there's not a single miss on it. Sing not a single miss. Look at it. All absolutely incredible. Ever since this guy got... um Yeah, so more colors, color, colors here. We've got some blacks and blues. So ever since he got named creative director, there's not been a single miss from this guy, man. It's absolutely wild to see, man. Like, consistency is out of the, loop, out of the fucking loop. Out of the world, sorry. Out of the stratosphere, wherever it may be. But yeah, check those out if you're interested. Um, when they, when are they meant to come out anyway? Let's see. When are they meant to come out? Are they out already? I'm not too sure. When did, did I say the date? Come hurry up. Uh, July 7th. So yeah, they should be out tomorrow. £195. $195, sorry. Check them out if you're that way inclined. Moving on. Um, yeah, moving on. Let's look at this, actually. No, where is this? Where is it? Where is it? Find it? Yeah, there it's here. Wrong one. So, let's talk about this. I'm I'm getting a little bit annoyed and frustrated, especially from people on fashion Twitter, or I feel like in general on, on you know fashion social media, I feel like there isn't enough respect given to the people who are legitimately carrying the fashion industry on their back. And I feel like a lot of those guys and girls are people who come from a streetwear education or streetwear background. Now, for whatever reason, people within the fashion with a capital F sphere, I feel like disrespect and disregard people who come from streetwear because they don't view streetwear as a credible or worthwhile um, design practice or something that will come close to warranting said person having a job at a big fashion house or a big fashion brand which i think is absolute nonsense especially nowadays with all the proof that we have with all these other you know people that have done great work virgil Abloh, of course rip being a great example of it but nowadays, these big fashion brands, big fashion houses are really struggling with relevancy. They're really struggling with connecting with youth culture. They're really struggling with tapping into the cultural zeitgeist. They're really struggling with just really being about it and being relevant and being in a conversation. They just don't know what to do. And most of it comes from, you know, them their insistence on not kind of freshening up their own ranks uh, maybe they just are kind of stuck in their own ways maybe they don't know whatever it may be the reason at least some of these people who are who own these fashion brands especially because they're kind of high level operators who are like ceos and ctos of like fintech companies whatever they may be who then come into fashion and not necessarily passion for fashion people they're able to look at it in a cold heart of day and say hey 
this brand, this house isn't going where we need to go. If we keep if we keep continuing on this on this trajectory, we're going to lose loads of money. We're going to have to shut stores, and we're going to be defunct. We need to revive this brand. Let's get out, get out there and look at the people who are actually garnering attention, who are selling out their crappy little streetwear brand and somehow be able to get that person, put them in this hot seat and hope that with more resources, with more help, uh, with more production, uh, you know, um, assets, whatever it may be, that we're maybe going to help them to raise their level and to maybe bring our brand kicking and screaming back into the 21st century. That's what most of these brands are doing. And for the most part, it's working phenomenally well, right? You look at the stuff that Virgil did at, Virg Virgil did at Louis Vuitton. And now you're looking at the stuff that um, Matthew Williams is doing at Givenchy. And then I think like there's no doubt in my mind that what Ma Matthew Williams is doing at Givenchy is definitely the reason why Givenchy has come back into the current conversation, whether you like it or you don't. Now, i am got a bit of a soft spot in my heart for Givenchy because I was a really big fan of the Ricardo Chichis era. I felt like Ricardo Chichis era, especially for the models that used to walk on the runway and the casting they used to do, was really refreshing because it was a real contrast from the sort of skinny... Um, super rock you know rock style that Hedy Samain was kind of pushing out when he was at let's say Saint Laurent right that was kind of the same sort of era and I felt like it was a real kind of difference again from the stuff that I was liking in terms of the casting of Rick Owens models back in the days too so to see these big burly kind of really ripped and muscular dudes walking on Givenchy and also see these really aggressive big baggy um, sort of clothes that were kind of before Balenciaga's time or before Vince Mott's time was also refreshing too because it wasn't all skinny, you know, bar main type style sizing. But of course, things move, things change. Givenchy went through a bit of a low stage and then, you know, um, Givenchy decided they needed to re revive the brand. So they went and tapped one, I think, one of the best designers out there on the market at the moment in Matthew Williams, who obviously founded Elix and was somebody that I felt like of the whole cohort that surrounds Kanye West or, you know, let's say the, that whole Bin Trio gang. Is there anybody that I felt like could maybe transfer their skills in screen printing t-shirts into maybe working for a big fashion house? I always felt like uh, Matthew Williams and funny enough, Heron Preston would be the best to do it. Because of Matthew Williams' kind of current background coming from, you know, costume design and styling and all that sort of stuff with Lady Gaga and having kind of big picture ideas and goals and telling a story, I felt like he could lend these skills to a fashion house way easier. In the same way that I felt like Heron Preston being a kind of communications person and not really being a fashion guy in that regard, he would also do really well because he could look at it from a kind of somewhat detached distance, right? Whereas opposed to where I felt like Virgil, because he was so engrossed in it, sometimes when, you're, when you love something too much you get too much in the weeds you start worrying about stuff that isn't really necessary isn't not wasn't you start worrying about you start over worrying about stuff they shouldn't be worrying about stuff without kind of looking at the bigger picture but regardless we move i still think my films has done a great job at, at Givenchy. i feel like he's 100 percent revived the brand himself personally in my regard um i feel like it's come back in a cultural conversation but for some reason on social media he doesn't get the respect I feel like he deserves. And I feel like it's very unwanted or it's somewhat, it's extremely unwarranted because I don't feel like there's much difference between what Givenchy's doing at the level that he's doing it between someone like a Jack Moose. But Jack Moose seems to get complete blight from some people. People look, look by it, even though I feel like Simon Pod, Jack Moose is completely, you know, fucked over his brand. It's not as good as it once was. It's definitely kind of resting on its laurels. And especially in the recent collection, it's just crap after crap after crap. But for whatever reason, because he has maybe the right face or he comes from the right background or he has the right education, people don't criticize him the same way they do Matthew Williams. And I feel like this little clip here, taken from the end of the Givenchy show, where some people were complaining and were upset that um, Matthew Williams was showing uh, clothes that, if I'm not mistaken, had print on it i think as we've done people people upset there was an actual look here that people were really pissed off about that seemed to really get people riled up on social media i think it might have been look which one is it yeah there we go it was look 25 look 27 this with the kind of um sweatsuit that had Givenchy emblazoned on the front of the crutch and Givenchy written again on like in an arc logo <coughs> on the zip up hoodie <coughs> Sorry. To me, this is like quintessential, easy kind of stuff that you would see in a fashion collection because you know that's definitely going to sell um, in store. And it's not something that's that crazy. Loads of brands have done hoodies. Loads of brands have done 
<coughs> sorry, top to bottom tracksuit in this way. But for some reason, the fact that he dared to put a logo on the front of the crotch of a sweatpant and the front of the crotch of a and the front of the chest of a hoodie, people lost their minds. And then they decided to kind of I won't say ambush him, but somewhat grill him on it. And it just felt a little bit disrespectful. And it also felt a little bit like they would never do this to Jack Moose, right? They would never do this to somebody, um, whoever's designing that, Chanel, who's kind of run, who's kind of just pushing out, you know, wasted fabric after wasted fabric, collection after wasted fabric. But for every reason, Matthew Williams gets this kind of question. So I'm going to play the clip for you quickly so you can hear what they say to him after the show. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with logos. Nothing wrong with logos. So, and I always, I don't know, maybe for me, it's weird because it's coming from a white dude too. I always felt like this aversion that fashion industry seems to have with streetwear, it always felt like a weird dog whistle to me. It, whenever I heard someone say, oh, the return of tailoring as a sort of retort, as a pushback against streetwear, it was sort of like their way of saying that how, oh yeah, this is going, we're going to go back to whitewashing this industry. We're going to go go back to having taking all these ragamuffins off of our runway no more trainers no more hoodies no more jeans all this sort of stuff it just really pissed me off because i feel like nowadays if you go if you look at just what people are wearing on the street day to day this idea that people are walking around with capital f fashion garments isn't the case regardless people are mixing and matching and changing their their way, their way of wearing of course demner at balenciaga and of course formerly of vetima he has kind of essentially single-handedly redefined what chic is by essentially elevating stuff like t-shirts and hoodies and jeans and whatnot but for the most part life in general people in the real world have kind of told the fashion industry in no uncertain terms that they don't want gaudy fashion capital f items for the most part they want stuff that's reflective of their real life stuff that they can actually wear in real time now there is still a place for that capital f fashion that still exists i feel like nowadays couture season hasn't been as great as i feel like couture season has been as best as it's ever been in recent times because there's a clear delineation between what couture is and what ready to wear is but still I feel like for a brand like Givenchy that's predominantly aimed, I feel like, at some sort of youth market that has its keys or is, is sort of like ties in streetwear in some ways, some regards, that was also in the lurch and out there, you know, not doing any great things for a while. To have someone like a Matthew Williams who can come in and revive the brand and make it covetable and make it interesting is what they wanted. And what they wanted was what he's basically serving on his runway. And I feel like that criticism that, that people have against him in terms of the logos and stuff mostly comes from people who don't actually exist or live in a real world and also doesn't come from people who actually will end up buying the stuff anyway because i feel like a lot of fashion people who kind of are overly critical about streetwear's influence on fashion number one don't even wear the clothes in the first place they don't buy them they don't even see them in stores they consume everything online and they just kind of operate from this kind of um I feel like idealistic, fanciful sort of idea of what they remember the brand was back in the day. But things change, things elevate, things move, times go on. And if you're a brand like Givenchy, House of Givenchy, and you want to reintroduce yourself back to the youth market, you want to be able to kind of resuscitate the brand after years of being out in the wilderness, to have somebody that can create hardware and jewelry pieces that look like this, that are covetable, great accessories, that are sunglasses like this, great outerwear pieces and jackets, because you know that's what he does really well at Leaks. Even the underwear now that they're kind of going into is, come on, man, that's going to be covetable, the logo on it, people are going to wear, the belt, the track, like, everything about this is absolutely stunning. I'd wear this entire look in the heartbeat and i'm sure there's plenty of other people that do the same thing and if i'm not mistaken this is kind of hard to see in this picture but this looks like pearls right and if you're familiar with what's going on now on tiktok and online on fashion nowadays with you know with the trendy kids now pearls are a big thing with kind of bro -y, chatty fashion type dudes so the fact that he's able to kind of make his twist on it and apply it to the Givenchy way and you know include this kind of padlock design that's sort of been the mainstay in what he's done at Givenchy for the moment he announced his tenure there I think is incredibly good to see and I feel like for somebody to take you know screen printing Bintro t-shirts um, doing what he did with at least when he first started and take that to Givenchy and actually make it look different because I still feel like there is a clear delineation between what he does at Givenchy and what he does at Alix, I think speaks a lot for how talented uh, Matthew Williams is as a, as a designer. 
um, that he's able to do this again with no formal training. It's come from somebody who's just learned on the go, learned via the internet, learned via experience, learned via real life, tactile doing stuff and to be able to apply it. Um, and all this sort of stuff, I feel like it's stuff that the people that actually own the brand, who actually look at the bottom line, who see the sales figures will be like, you know what, this is going to work really well. This sort of stuff, it's going to sell like hotcakes, this kind of bandana, um, snood, face mask type thing. Like, come on, man, you know it's really going to do well. It's got a backpack here with the Givenchy written on the, on the straps, this Anorak um, half zip jacket with the Givenchy logo here, the gloves, workwear type gloves, I guess he's done, he's kind of twist on, he's twist on rain boots that everyone's wearing nowadays. Like, it's all really great stuff that you know is going to sell and it's going to do really well when it eventually does end up coming out so this idea that the, the logos are a bad thing is insane and i feel like it's again a dog whistle to get people like myself out of the industry and to kind of whitewash it again which i feel like is absolutely ridiculous because we are where we are the door's already been open flood of my streetwear um alumni and fan and uh, no, alumni and peers and people that i kind of looked up to have kind of forced their way in and they're not going away anytime soon because now <coughs> that same streetwear fan who kind of follow those guys into these brands are also going to slightly slowly but surely mature into those brands and are going to want to wear them on a kind of daily and week yearly basis and that's probably what these brands want as well they want to be able to take a kid who wants to imagine your Givenchy and you hire Matthew Williams under the under the proviso that he's going to hopefully be able to take a kid who bought a roller coaster belt back in the day or like a chest rig and he's going to be able to take him through the journey of maybe buying some boots that he saw Ian Connor wear from Elite's maybe buying a jacket and now he's like 21, 22 he's got his first job and now maybe he wants to buy a suit and he ends up buying his first suit from Givenchy because Matthew Williams the guy that he kind of grew up idolising is now a Givenchy and then that kid ends up being maybe a long time Givenchy buyer or something else maybe when he turns 40 he ends up being a guy who just buys all his trunks and his suitcases and his levers pieces whatever it may be from Givenchy only that's kind of the long term goal they have with this sort of thing so I feel like in the end it does end up paying dividends like I mean especially if they're good at their job obviously if they're not good at their job it kind of hurts the brand but I feel like if you're decent enough at what you do and I feel like, you know, Matthew Williams already kind of transcended street when he does it at Leaks. I think at Leaks already was, you know, essentially fashion with a capital F. So he had loads of practice doing it, but he's able to kind of, you know, continue doing it also at Givenchy. I feel like it was a really great step. And I actually like that earring too. Look, the padlock on the earring too. Like, this is all stuff that I'd wear in a heartbeat. So, yeah, I feel like the, the criticism against um, Matthew Williams is really unwarranted. Um, I feel like they wouldn't ask those kind of questions and grill, you know, Simon Pot uh, flipping at uh, Jack Moose with about the same sort of thing, even though I feel like he's come from a way higher lofty kind of position and crashed and looks completely different to what you know a shadow of his former self the recent collaboration with nike is horrendous the recent collection of itself was horrendous it's all really rather less and repetitive stuff that doesn't necessarily feel interesting in the slightest but for some reason people turn a blind eye to that but they want to grill matthew williams it's just really really unfair in my opinion um but hey maybe i'm in the minority there maybe i'm in the minority but yeah that is the Action Zing Show episode number 38. What was that? Seven, I said. Thanks so much for tuning into the show. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here. Really has been. I oh, was sorry, 386, sorry, 386. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you listen to the show via the podcast, you'll hear an audio song play out, my tune of the day. If you're watching, the song, watching this via YouTube, you won't hear anything. It will just zoom out. And I'll see you guys again very soon. Take care. Peace.